Hello and welcome to another episode of Conscious Living, Conscious Dying. And today I'm here with Patrick Lehetz. Did I, did I say that right? No. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Doesn't matter, okay. And um, as you might know, uh, two years ago my husband died and then I did a series about uh, conscious living, conscious dying, because I felt that when people die, you know, the surroundings, they don't really go with you. They, they sort of, you know, either they try to avoid you or they, they don't want you to talk about it. And so I decided that I want to have a discourse on internet with people who have gone through the similar experiences. And today, two years afterwards, I mean, in this period of November, I'm doing a mini series about that. And I'm happy that you are here. The intention is to inspire people that accompanying a person in the death process is a very, very valuable thing to do. It is difficult and really brings you on the edge of your possibilities, but you can grow. And that's, I think, what we want to talk about here. But before yeah. we do that, tell me a little bit about you. Okay, yeah. Um, my name is Patrick Leenheers. I am from Amsterdam or a village close to Amsterdam uh, in the middle of the Netherlands. And uh, perhaps it might be interesting for people who watch this is that we met only last week through a circle, a, a ULAB circle. We're going through a Theory U course together, and that's how we met. I am a, um, professionally, I am a facilitator of leadership journeys and innovation programs. And most of my clients are large corporate structures. I have worked inside corporate for 20 years myself, a company called Vodafone, also well known in the German space. And um, I'm a father of two, two boys, 14 and 15, about to turn 16 next week. And um, I lost my wife, Sophie, on the 13th of January of this year. And uh, yeah, we'd been together quite long, actually. We'd met in the first year of university when we were both 18 and 19. And uh, so the first 10 years of our togetherness, we were studying and we're going through our first job and first home. And then after it took us 10 years to get married. And then we spent another 20 years of married life together. So altogether, we've almost spent 30 years of our lives together, which is more than what we had individually. So, uh, so yeah, it was a very long and intense and uh, beautiful relationship. And uh, she died from breast cancer. She had had a first episode of breast cancer in 2006 when our kids were very young. Actually, our youngest was only five months when, when she discovered the first instance. And then, uh, so she had chemotherapy and all of that in 2006. And then of 2007, we started to rebuild our lives. And um, in 2017, exactly 10 years after, uh, she first had a, an injury from playing tennis and it took a couple of months before the, the doctors found out that actually the cancer had come back and that it had uh, metastasized, as they call that, into the bone structures. So, uh, and that means that uh, it's actually no longer reversible. It becomes, uh, well, you know, basically that you will die from that disease. So. For three years, we've lived and gone through together through the process of illness, becoming more and more sick, actually. And, um, and then, yeah, last January, uh, on the 13th, uh, on a Monday morning at three o'clock in the morning, or 2.54 to be exact, uh, she passed away. Oh, wow. Well. You would think after 10 years, the cancer would have been defeated, no? That's uh, what the people said, yeah, that the, uh, the likelihood of this happening after 10 years is actually similar or the same as the likelihood of it happening to any woman. You know, it's, uh, it is, it's really, um, let's say, the unlucky, unlucky lottery, if you will, mm. that, uh, that it came back. 
Yeah, and the, with metastasis in the bones, that makes um, um, it hurts. It hurts. It hurts. That's yes. Whoa. Uh, yeah, maybe you can talk about how it was for her, but then also how it was for you this period. How did she cope with that? How how was her spirit? And he was very strong, very strong, and. Um... So she, for example, she didn't like to take a lot of pain medication. And indeed she has had, uh, or she always was in pain. There, always, there also have been periods, like sometimes a week in which there was so much pain that she wouldn't be able to just get out of bed. You know, she has actually no life anymore. You know, that's how I've experienced that, is that it, if you're not ill, but if you only have pain, still that takes away all your energy at some level, the only thing you can do is just lie in your bed, perhaps watch some television shows, uh, really silly shows. Um, so I would encourage her to take a little bit more pain medication so that at least she could come out of bed and she could walk and she could make something of the day, even if it just was a walk with a dog. Um, and the other thing, she, um, she had a very clear distinction in her head but she said, I have, um, uh, she said, there's, a, there's the part of the illness that kills me. And there's part of the illness that is, um, uh, yeah, she called it ongemak. In German, it's probably something like ungemak or um, it's, it's uh, discomfort, basically discomfort. So anything from, let's say, chemotherapy side effects to um, she would at some stage, she would get her hands and her feet would start to get really painful because of a phenomena called neuropathy. And which meant that she couldn't walk properly anymore. She had to put uh, soft um, bandages around her feet or and she, at the, in the final stages, she wasn't able to to close her the buttons of her blouse, for example, and all those things, she said, "Well, but that's not killing me. That is uh, discomfort, but it's not killing me." And um, so she was able to cope with a lot of pain, a lot of discomfort, a lot of, let's say, the side effects from the medication or the side effects from the disease, because she just wanted to keep on going. She just wanted to keep on going, and. Um, what also was difficult for her is that step by step, you have to give up parts of your identity, let's say. So when you're in full life, you're a mother, a wife, a sister, a daughter, uh, you have strong relationships with both sons, you do different things with them, uh, you have lots of friends, you have a job. I mean, she was a teacher, societal studies at the secondary school. And as the illness progresses, step by step, you have less energy for any of those things. So um, about half a year before she died, she stopped working, for example. And, you know, the new school year was starting in September. And a week before the school year started, she went to the school and she saw the colleagues and she just said, I'm not going to start anymore. It, I can't do it. I can't start a year which I know I won't be able to end. And and you know the start of year needs to be something with high energy and fun, and you want to engage with a new group of of children. And she basically she could have worked for another couple of months, perhaps, but she felt like it was not okay to start this if she couldn't uh, if she couldn't end it. So and those steps, like she had to give up sports, for example, we played tennis, and immediately after she got the diagnosis, she stopped playing tennis with me. So early on, but throughout the process, but later on, and, and, and especially in the last couple of weeks, actually the only thing that she still could do was be a mother. You know, she was with the children, she could do some homework. Um, she was a very strict mother. So the boys also remember her as sometimes very angry. Uh, that also goes with the disease. You know, the people at the end get, they get very angry and they actually are sometimes a little bit hard to be around. And, uh, but she felt that the only thing that she didn't want to give up is to be a mother. 
So she pushed and she, she would get up out of bed and she would make sure that homework was done and that they, uh, yeah, that they were looked after. You know, she would every morning, and I, I do that now, but every morning we would make sandwiches for the boys to take to school. Uh, my son is 16 now, and he's the only person in his class that still have his sandwiches made by his parents. All the other kids do it themselves. But Sophie just said, as long as I can do this, I will do this for my son. So they are completely spoiled, obviously. They're partially my sons are not grown up as other kids are, you know, other parts of them are more grown up than other kids. But it's one of those symbolic things, right? That you stand up, you get out of bed every morning at uh, half past seven to make sandwiches for your son because that's what you can do. And then you go yeah. back to bed. And which gives, gives also still sense to, to life, no? When you yes. have something you have to take care for. Yeah, it, it, oh, it wow. is. Um, by giving up on all of these identities or parts of your identity, you know, it becomes harder also to still feel like I matter. Yeah, exactly. And I still yeah. can contribute, no? Yep. Despite all. But what you are telling me, it's really that she must have been very lucid, very, 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 very unusual, I would say, because normally people get only angry <laughs> and, and don't and want to have no pain and, and then, you know, get into the victim uh, thing. No, she know? didn't. She was very conscious of that. Exactly. She, she didn't mm -hmm. want to be a victim. She wanted to live life. And that was also a bit of a contract between us, like live life as normally as possible. And in the early year, like in the first year and a half, the illness hardly manifests, actually. You can only see it when you go scan for it. But in daily life, you don't see it, but you do know it. So the illness is actually an abstraction, but it does change your life completely. If you know that you're walking around with a ticking time bomb and that you have maybe four years, maybe five, but more likely two or three, um, that changes how you live. And um, I had to... How, yeah, how actually did she die then? Was she in bed at the end or how was yeah. it? Yeah, so um, we went to a final skiing holiday uh, in December last year, uh, so that, over the new year. So I brought her home, I think on the 5th or the 6th of January and she had to go to the hospital for a routine check. And uh, in the course of that Monday morning, they rang her up and they say, you have to come back to the hospital because you're not good. So uh, I took her to the hospital and uh, basically what they said there is, uh, your condition now is so bad that we have to stop all medication. And um, we're gonna give you some fluids to uh, give you another, let's say a, a push, a power push. And then we're gonna send you home for you to spend the last couple of weeks with your family. And uh, so I got her home on Wednesday. And at that stage, she actually thought that she would have another three, four weeks to live. But I saw her and she hardly was drinking anymore and hardly was eating anymore. So, and, you know, and I had to keep track of the amount of fluids that she was taking as a, as a caregiver. So I knew that she was drinking less than a liter per day. And I knew that that is not enough. You know, then you're basically the process of dying has set in. So against her will, I rang a, her, her best friend lives in Stockholm. So I rang her best friend to come over as quickly as possible. Uh, she got there by Saturday morning. And actually that upset Sophie very much because she's like, I have another four weeks. You know, why do you need to bring my friend in so quickly? You don't have to rush things. So at that stage, this was hard because I said, Sophie, I don't know whether you have four weeks. And again, she would be very angry with me because she was like, oh, you don't trust me and I trust my body. And, and, and that's what the doctor said. And, you know, you're panicking and you're rushing things. Uh, but the reality was that after that conversation on Saturday morning, actually, she went to sleep and she didn't, she hasn't woken up from that sleep. So she has slept for about 36 hours into the night from Sunday to Monday. 
And at, uh, as I mentioned, at three o'clock in the morning, actually, she stopped breathing. And um, uh, I must say, the last four or five days were actually really beautiful. She was in the home, in the house with me, and uh, we played music, and uh, she still watched a Marvel movie with her with our eldest son because she always would watch Marvel movies uh, like Superman and Spider-Man and stuff <laughs> like that and she watched the soccer game with my youngest son because they always would go to Ajax which is the Amsterdam soccer club and uh, we would sit together we wouldn't talk even that much we just you know I'd be here and we'd light some candles and play some music and she would be sort of lucid sleeping dreaming talking and uh, it was very serene, uh, very, very peaceful. And I had lined up a string of family and friends who would come and, and, and see her. Um, most of them actually couldn't come until the weekend. So from Saturday morning onwards, after this friend from Stockholm came, I've had visitors, you know, 18 hours per day, sort of, um, you know, the one coming in, the other one going. And uh, so, um, Everybody that was dear to her uh, has come to see her, and uh, but she was sleeping most of the time. She slept. Uh, actually, my youngest son has had the last words with her, like five o'clock on Saturday. And he, um, she, she came out of her coma. It, effectively, it was a coma, and she came out of her coma for like a few minutes, and 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 he said, "Mom, do you want to drink a little bit of water?" And so she drank a last sip of water from the glass that my son was holding. And then she went back to sleep and, and, but we were all there, you know, we were all sitting around the bed and uh, it was quiet and peaceful. We, everybody knew what was going on. <clears throat> and then in the final hours, um, uh, her sister lives in, in Basel. So uh, she could only come at Sunday evening. So Sunday evening, 11 o'clock, she arrived. So she's been with me and her sister for the last four hours of her life. And my youngest son, actually, he couldn't sleep. So he was in bed. But at around, I think, 2.30 in the morning, he just got out of bed and he came downstairs. And and we had a person here who was, yeah, sort of a, a, a care, care person, you know, a night nurse. And she was very clear. That was nice. She, she said, oh, it's happening. You know, this is probably only going to be a couple of hours. And no one else had told me that, you know, the doctors were always saying, well, you never know. And it could be another two days. And, but, you know, you know every, anything can happen. But this nurse, she was giving us more structure. She said, hey, it's, it's happening now. You know, it's just tonight, this night she will die. And so at half past two, when my son came downstairs, she was the one saying, go sit next to your mother because it's it's very near now it's very near now so he spent the last half hour with us and um yeah just very close sitting on her bed holding her hand while she was asleep deep sleep and the breathing would get shallower and shallower and shallower to the point that um that you would stop you know and then you wait for a minute and then maybe you have one more breath and then after a while, we said, no, I think that that's it. That's it. So then I checked my watch and I said, well, let's say that she died at 2.54. You know, you have to make that up because by the time you know, it's three o'clock. And uh, yeah. And then you get the doctor, you know, do you need to ring the doctor and you, the whole yeah, yeah. machineries of people yeah. coming in and... Uh, but I w I'm interested in how your state of mind was and also that of the, your, your kids. I mean, they are quite young and to lose the mother and to live three years under the threat of losing the mother. I imagine that that's very, very hard and that will make them grow for sure, but also give them some difficult things to work on when they are older, I guess. So how did you see how did they manage to to get on in this situation yeah well there's a couple of things that that help um one actually is denial the power of denial like in daily life 
when you go to school and I go to work and we eat together and everything is actually quite normal. So then if you don't talk about it, if you don't think about it too much, then, you know, a lot of the time actually goes by quite normal, just life going by. Um, what we did do is um, every school holiday, we would go away, the four of us. So three years in a row, we've had six holidays. It's outrageous, I know. But we made the most beautiful trips. We've gone to uh, Oman in, in the Arab, uh, in the Arab uh, area. We've made a long trip to the United States. Um, we've been to Tanzania to see the wildlife in the Serengeti. Um, we've been to Curaçao where we've been diving together. And she was still, this was four or five months before she passed. And she was snorkeling with us whilst we were diving and you know the boys were getting their divers diploma so we enjoyed life to the max you know and and, and she she took a um uh she she she, she, she subscribed to a membership of ajax the soccer club that i talked about so with her youngest son our youngest son she saw every match and this was a, a year that Ajax was extremely successful actually in their competition and also in the European competition. So they've seen, you know, the biggest clubs of Europe play here in Amsterdam. So, and we went to see uh, pop concerts, for example, we went to Bruno Marx together when they were in Amsterdam and, and uh, yeah, so all kinds of theater plays. Uh, we, we lived out life to the max. And I guess that's a good thing if you know for sure that you will be dying in a couple of years then you know why why keep all your savings you, know, you might as well just do whatever you want to do and, and live life to the max so so we did that and and the first time we did that it felt a little bit double like we do this because you're dying um but that's also something that we got used to and we could thoroughly genuinely enjoy all those activities uh, as a family together uh, because yeah it was fun and yeah we knew that she was dying but hey yeah that's part of life for us that's that's great an attitude like this no that you uh, include death in in life instead of being afraid and uh, trying to avoid it and what i also am hearing that you could talk freely about that yeah. that she didn't avoid the, the topic and saying oh no I, I will live forever or something like this so no it was no. very real it was yeah so i i have at some stages discussed with her whether she would want to go let's say alternative medicine or meditation mm -hmm. and rigpa energy energetic healing and things like that and she was very adamant she said no i totally don't believe in that space um, I cannot meditate my cancer away, is how she would put it. She was very direct, very Dutch direct. And uh, so she said, I know that there's chemotherapy and that is effective for some time. And after that, I will die. And uh, if I'm lucky, it's five years. If I'm uh, average, it's three. And she made three. So that never was... And I must say, I really thank her for that because I, I know of people who either don't want to talk about it at all and pretend as if it's not there mm. or people that, that do go into that space of, hey, I'm going to eat very healthy, I'm going to meditate and I'm going to be the 1% chance to beat this. And then they ask everybody around them to go and believe that too. And that's sometimes difficult to believe if you don't believe that. But the patient wants you to go into that, then you know you get you may get into a loyalty conflict, into an inner conflict of, I think you won't beat the disease, but you want me to think it for you or think it with you. So that, that I'm I'm grateful that she didn't ask that of me. It was almost a little bit the opposite, you know. I agreed with her that I I also don't believe that you can meditate your cancer away, but I do believe that through practices of acceptance uh that that you i i i thought you know maybe you can w work through a little bit of that anger that you have and uh, because mm -hmm. she, until she went to sleep 
she was very clear that she didn't want to die. She mm. felt like, I'm a mother, my boys are 15, 14, I'm not done yet, this is not fair, I don't want to go. And for a while, I tried her to move her into, you know, can you accept it is there, you have to go. Can you move to some sort of acceptance? And then she asked me, can you stop pushing me to go to acceptance? And can you accept that I will not accept? So I then turned around. And with hindsight also, she said that that was very, uh, that was a, a game changer for her. That uh, for a while she felt very alone because, because I pushed her to accept and she didn't want to accept. So she felt I wasn't with her. Mm. But when I accepted that she was never going to accept, we were more together in the process. And she felt like you, know, you weren't pushing me to go to all kinds of weird stuff or eat curcuma or uh, whatever th you know people believe in. And you know, I respect, I respect those things. I, I I'm open to all of that. But I guess the most important lesson for me was to. Uh, accept how how she wanted to live this you know that was what kept us close that's wonderful yeah. and at the same time i must say that um both i think any parent that has gone through kids with uh, let's say teenage puberty that tends to bring out differences in the relationship so it was difficult between us sometimes on our parenting styles and if you put disease on top of that, you know, those differences actually get even starker. So you get even more, like, I think we should do it this way. Now I should do it this way. <clears throat> and often we couldn't find each other anymore. You know, we couldn't agree, you know, I, she would just keep on her opinion and I was like, no. And so. It's, that brings me to the question, how did you cope? Because you know that you are not going to die probably, but she mm -hmm. will. And so you also are the caregiver and you want to keep her in some good mood and, and do everything for her. So how could you do that? You know, because let's say we are a little bit biased, no? We, we, are, we cannot treat the other person as if nothing has happened. So. No. Uh, how did you manage to do that? Well, I think on one hand, I went to a bit of a survival mode. You know, I, I started to take on more tasks. Like we've always been very 50-50% in the household. You know, the groceries, the cooking, the dishwashing, the laundry, we, we split that. And I started to take on more and more and more because she could do less and less and less. Mm. Um, I um, I think I put quite a bit of energy in the dinner every day. So thinking creatively, you know, making really nice food, uh, creating a nice family moment also at the end of the day. Um, I would spend time sitting next to her on the bed. So I, I reduced, I, I was lucky enough that I could reduce the hours that I work to 50% and in the last couple of months, even to just one day per week. So I could be at home almost always and be in the house, be close to her and we would sit together on the bed and watch uh, uh, say yes to the dress and uh, absolutely silly shows like that. And, um, and to be honest, there was also times, especially later at night, when I needed time for myself, when the boys were in bed and she was also in bed. And then I would go and sit by myself in the living room and just sit and listen music and have a glass of wine and, or watch some TV. And I know that in those hours, often she was lonely upstairs and I was lonely downstairs and we were both alone in our loneliness, but it was sometimes not I, I didn't have the energy to, to be next to her and, and yeah, do nothing or disagree on something or be angry or. Yeah, I think it's so important that we don't get eaten up by the role of the caregiver because it's really, it's, it's being 
able to 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 get your all and you you go out of of your own mind when you don't have some breaks in between yeah so i felt that too i was fortunate because my husband from the diagnosis diagnosis mm -hmm. uh, to his death was only three months wow and it was very quick so and afterwards, and, and I think he also decided actively to use a moment uh, when a friend was here, a Dutch friend, by the way, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, he had a breath attack, he had a, um, lung cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he fell over and died when he was still able to move. He only had to have oxygen and he had to pee every hour. So there mm. was already something going on in, in the body. So it was uncomfortable. He had also uh, metastasis and pain, very mm. much pain. Mm. And but he could have lived in a bad state still for some months. And I think he unconsciously maybe has decided to use this moment and just fell over and die. And I think he did it also for me because I felt after these three months, I felt very much at the edge, you know? Yeah. And I didn't have anybody to help, uh, you know? So I, it was all on me and also at night, every hour get up and so I couldn't even sleep, you know? Yeah. He tried to do everything alone, but at a certain point he couldn't. So I had to, to help him. And, you know, when you are a caregiver, at least me, I always, you know, attentive and listen for what, you know, and things. It's really, really heavy, but, but it's also a gift. And I wonder now uh, if you can talk me a little bit about what you have learned and what, how you can integrate that in your life and into the future. Yeah, so maybe to respond to your um, the caregiving, I think I was lucky that uh, until, let's say, three weeks before she passed, she was basically totally able to look after herself. Oh, good. And um, it's uh, really only in the skiing holiday. We had Christmas. Uh, the Christmas days were I needed to, you know, close her coat for her and put her in the car and so the Christmas period and the, the holidays and then that one week in January is where I really was full-time caregiver and uh, indeed that is intense that is very intense and uh, I was lucky also to have lots of neighbors and friends that could help me with it and then to your question about what did I learn from it is um, I think early on in the process I was speaking to a, uh, a coach and uh, uh, she's a psychologist and she uses many different coaching techniques, voice dialogue, but also systemic work and energetic work. And she, um, she pointed out to me the importance of compassion. And, you know, because I was angry with Sophie actually all the time. And I thought it had nothing to do with the disease. It had to do with just how she behaved and 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 this coach actually learned to see that her behavior was also a result of the disease and her anxiety and her stress and her pain so that could i shift my anger to the disease instead of to the person and find compassion with the situation and with her and with myself and with my children and so and she encouraged me i come from the south of the netherlands and uh uh, there it's predominantly Catholic and I remember growing up uh, in an area where there's a small square that would have a statue of Jesus with a, a burning heart on top of his mm -hmm. chest you may see that that image and it's a very common Catholic image and, uh, and she said why don't you go to a Brika Brak store in Amsterdam and see where you can find a little statue like that and I was like what? But I did it. I did. So I bought a little Jesus statue. Not that I'm a practicing Catholic anymore, but it's, I put it next to the bed in the windowsill to just remind myself every day, you know, have the courage to have compassion. And if it's difficult, try to find a way to soften up inside because that can help soften up the situation or at least make it a little bit more bearable for yourself. So compassion, I think, is one thing. Um, the other thing is, I've now experienced that it's not frightening or 
of, it's not filled with fear. The actual process of the end of life is not a scary thing. And I found it a real gift. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've mentioned it, I think once or twice, but um, obviously I, I've been with her when our both our children were born and I was with her when, when she passed away. And I feel like those moments are almost similar in level of sacredness and, and how personal they are, how private they are, how intimate they are. And so having been allowed to be with a person in the final hours, minutes, I think is a real gift. Okay. It's really beautiful to, to have a relationship with someone else that you can be there, that you're allowed in, in that situation. And I was, for a long time, I was afraid. So when in the weeks and months before, I was like, how is this going to go? And when, and, and then what? And mm -hmm. all of those things. And, mm -hmm. and then it just comes and it is there and it goes and it was there and it's all okay. Did you also experience that it's like the time doesn't exist in these hours, in these days? Well, yeah. Yeah, I'd say the time expands. It's yeah. like everything yeah. slows down. Yeah. And the, the closer you come to the moment, the more the world seems to come to a standstill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I've wondered also, because she, she passed around three o'clock in the morning, which literally is the darkest hour of the night, right? If the night starts at around 10 9 10 mm -hmm. and the sun comes back up at around 9 10 in the morning exactly in the middle so really when the sun was over australia is when she passed away so is that yeah i thought that was beautiful that was mm -hmm. very symbolic in a way yeah. that she 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 chose the this still quiet quietest moment in the um in the day to just very quietly disappear yeah. in the disappear. dark exactly no? yeah. Yeah. yeah very nice and when she then died and could you keep her at home for a while or yeah, yeah. oh that's good yeah she was here it was <clears throat> we, we i did get it a little bit into a rush because we wanted to do the the ceremony in a church uh, that is one village up the road and that is because it's actually not a church we go to for service. It's a church we go to once per year to see the um, uh, Matthäus Passion. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. And uh, it is perhaps the oldest Matthäus Passion. There's now plenty of Matthäus Passion performances in the Netherlands. But this one was already 100 years ago. In this particular church, this, this same group already started performing the Matthäus Passion. So it's been a, a family tradition for us for over 40 years to go there on the Thursday before Easter. And uh, lo and behold, um, my, my, uh, I called him my funeral buddy, you know, but he, he was my undertaker, but he, he's, a, he's my age, a little bit younger even than I am. A great guy, he really helped me. And so he came in the Monday morning when she had passed. And he said, Patrick, if you want to do your service there, you have to do it on Thursday because on Friday, they're going to build up an exposition, an art exposi exposition. So I was like, okay, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, that's three days. And he said, yeah, it's about the shortest that I've ever done, but I think we can pull this off. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so for those four days, you know, she was in the house. Uh, it, it, the, the stream of visitors continued from pre the weekend when she was still with us until after, uh, you know, all the family from Switzerland came on Tuesday and my parents came on the Monday. And, everybody uh, friends from all over the netherlands um, That's nice. on, on the thursday we had even a friend from sydney you know she booked a ticket the day that she heard it and uh, so she was with us on the day of the service and so it was a rush a rush of getting st things organized um, and between all that work we would just go visit her and uh, so she was upstairs, there was a room for her. Uh, we made a bit of an altar with music and uh, you know, flowers and candles and, and some personal artifacts like a wedding ring and, and yeah, the book that she was reading and you know, 
simple things. But That's it was wonderful a, that you can do that because there are countries where you cannot keep the uh, dead body at home, you know, so really good. Yeah, I think I am. In, in general, I think in the Netherlands, we're quite lucky because we are, uh, our uh, family doctors are quite okay also with helping uh, the, let's say, the, the process of passing to be as comfortable as possible. Mm -hmm. You know, there's active euthanasia is still not happening that much. It's allowed, it's possible. If you really want it, you can ask for it. But what they call um, sedation, and um, Sophie didn't need it, you know, her body took care of it herself. She went into a natural sedation, into a natural coma. Um, but yeah, keeping people at home, dying at home, staying at home, um, dying in a very peaceful way, you know, sleeping, uh, that all is, uh, is very, very possible. Very good, very good, yeah. So uh, I think uh, after the death, you have a lot of things to do that keeps you also for going into desperation. And <laughs> yeah. you know, there is a sort of a, a, a interval where you can uh, be active and afterwards then what, what happened to you? Did that happen this <laughs> for yeah. And your children I, especially. Yeah, so, well, I kept active until only three or four weeks ago, actually. Uh, okay. uh, because uh, obviously a couple of weeks after she passed away, uh, COVID came and we had mm -hmm. to go in lockdown. And so both my boys were here and I was trying to make them go to school online. One actually was very diligent and he, he went to school. The other one was completely obstinate and didn't want to go forward or backward. So I spent a lot of time with him and with his school and thinking how, you know, what, what, what are we going to do? And so in that process, we, we changed. So this new school year, he went to a different school and it's still difficult. It's still not going super well. Is it going now in person or is it still online? Uh, no, they are going in person. Hmm. Okay. This week happens to be an exception, but uh, no, uh, in, the schools are still open in the Netherlands. But yeah, I mean, I there was all kinds of things. There was um, many, many people wanted to see me after the funeral, you know, and, and there were like 500 people there. Uh, many of our friends from the university period, you know, because we've been together for so long. We have lots of friends from long time ago that we don't see that often anymore. So, and then when you all get together on a funeral, it's like a big reunion. And what happens on a big reunion, people say, oh, we should catch up. We should see each other. So I think I've had maybe hundred or so, and it could be walking the dog or lunch or going out to sit on a terrace and have a glass of wine or phone calls, uh, the people sending me postcards and letters. And so there's a very strong wave I, I i called it a wave of love actually a wave of attention very very warm very warm and um so between doing the household uh, i think but what i also noticed is that the three of us as a family system we needed to reinvent ourselves you know there was what time do we get up? What time do we go to bed? Uh, what time do we eat? Do we eat together every day? I don't want to eat together every day. And I, I don't want to eat with you cook. And so there's so many, let's say it's so disruptive. It's so chaotic. Mm -hmm. And to settle that, you know, and I was very worried about my son not going to school. So uh, I also went to see a, a, a therapist, a systems therapist a specialized in you know, how the families evolve. So I talked to a lot of people about what is going on with me, what is going on with him, what is going on with, with us to, to, it's almost like you have to make sense. It's so chaotic that mm -hmm. I just didn't understand my life, even though it was simple in the sense that I wasn't working that much and the school was not happening that much. So a lot of energy into just settling in the new situation and, and developing new habits, new routines, new ways of, yeah, operating as a family. And uh, 
So it's that, it's the social part. It is also, there is a business part to it, like, you know, all kinds of formalities that need to be taken care of. Um, she was always the one that planned our holidays. So that by the time that the summer holidays came, I was like, oh my God, now I need to figure out how we're gonna do for a holiday. And that was COVID season still. So, you know, where can we go? What's allowed? So it's very busy at many levels with just with life. And um, I think that kept me going as well. And what I'm noticing is that um, grief is all of this. I didn't have a good idea what grief was. I thought grief was indeed collapse, uh, despair, endless hours of crying. And I haven't had any of that, but I have had confusion. I've had low energy. I've had uh, low motivation. You know, very few things that appeal to me. Uh, you know, just, and, and, Perhaps also interesting to, to mention is um, together with two colleagues, uh, we did an online course about the Bardos. It is uh, the Bardos is a, a Buddhist principle of living and dying, and uh, I felt like I want to understand the dying process and what happens after that better. So I I I I, I had bought the book, the Tibetan book of living and dying. You know, many people know it. And, um, but through this Bardo practice, you know, I took up my more, more regular meditation practice and we would have on Fridays would have a, a zoom call like this, talking about the, the lectures and uh, it introduced me also to all kinds of beautiful metaphors and, and poetry and, uh, and I felt like, wow, I, I'm, I so need that. I, I so need beauty, like beautiful music. Uh, you know, I've been playing Matthias Pachon year round now, because that is such soothing, beautiful, immersive music. So I, I, I really went to those spaces, you know, wise people, people that have lived before me that um, I could just talk to and they would just listen and, and nod and poetry, music, and things that soothe, that inspire, and those would give me energy, like many other things would cost me energy. And I found it difficult to put myself to that. Yeah. And so those, those things helped a meditation practice and lots of walking, 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 always outside with a dog, with another friend, walking, talking. Yeah. Yeah. That is a, that's a possibility no, of, of living grief. And I think a very healthy one also. Yeah. In our series, uh, I talked with a, a, um, a woman, now it is, she is a woman, but she lost her father in the age of your sons. And she said only after a long time she could uh, work on the grief. And she now has become a grief uh, activist. She is an artist and she is doing art for inspiring people uh, to live the grief and to, to, but she said she, af, right after the death, she was sort of in shock. She couldn't really get in, but only after about 10 years, she, she began to, to uh, live the grief in her way. And she said, then nobody understood it, but that's long ago, you should be over it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, then the misunderstanding that grief is not just something that you have two days or three days. Yeah. In a certain way, you have it all your life, but it's not hindering you. And when we met in, the, in one of these calls, you told me that now it's also different for you, how you see your work. Yes. How you approach your work. I would think uh, that we talk a little bit still about that. Well, yeah, maybe um, an interesting story, at least for me, it was interesting, is that uh, a week before she passed away, I got a phone call from a new client. Um, and uh, this was a climate change pro project. And it's a corporate client. And, um, and this was a lady that I'd never had on the phone before. So she was completely new to me and we couldn't see each other because she, she rang me. And then I said, well, um, I need to tell you something. I'm here with my wife and she's dying. Uh, it could be a month, it could be a week, but I, 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 
I'm just not in the space of, literally I said, I'm not in the space of picking up another corporate bullshit project about climate change. So is this real or not? And this lady must have thought, what is this? Who is this guy, you know? But it made also because she was like, wow, this guy's serious. And actually it was the reason why she chose me to do that job, to do that work. Because she immediately felt that one, I could be open about this in the first five minutes of a phone call with a stranger about a new project. And she's like, okay, so apparently you're trusting enough to mention what you're actually going through. And you, it's very understandable that your priorities become very clear what you do and what you don't do. And anything that doesn't give you a sense of purpose is just, I can no longer do it. I, I can only do work that I truly believe in and that the people that I work with are also committed and we're truly trying to achieve something. And it's okay if it fails, but it's not okay if we're actually not in it wholeheartedly and not trying to the best of our abilities. So. Um, it has given you maybe the view for what is really important in life. Yeah. And perhaps even a bit of courage to say no to things. And I must admit, if I'm purely honest, that, you know, nine months on, I'm not as black and white as I was in that week when it's happening. But I, I try to keep that, you know, you ask, how do you integrate it into your life? I try to keep it. It's um, you know, only do only do things that feel truly meaningful. Um, say no to the rest. Um, I think I also shifted in terms of what impact am I trying to have? Like in let's say two, three years ago, I would dream of having sweeping impact in a big industry on uh, let's say uh, CO2 emissions. And now I'm actually looking at the impact that I'm having on the person I'm working with. So it's on a much smaller scale. I'm just looking at, am I helping? Do I feel that I make a contribution? Um, does that other person feel helped, valued, acknowledged? That is what I do it for. And whether or not that industry will clean up its act in terms of CO2 emissions, I hope as a byproduct, but it's no longer the reason why I do what I do. That's wonderful because I think that's a way to come from the inside out and not to do things from, you know, on the big level and the people are not ready to, 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 yeah. to do that. So I think it's very, very beautiful what you're doing. I think I this try is, in my way also to do that, being having impact on people, but not on on the things, as you say, there is sort of a byproduct. The, the more we develop our consciousness and our, you, you called it compassion, that's a very good word for that, our compassion for life, mm. <laughs> the more we, things will change. And that's so important that there are more of us to, to do that work instead of trying to, to fix a, an implant or, or something like that. Yeah. You know? That's good too, but that's not the main well, thing. I, I, I feel that what I need is uh, softness and beauty and uh, kindness and, and, and be feel that you can be carried by another person and sometimes carry for another person. Yeah. But those are the things that I feel I, I need right now. And as such, if I get involved in very strategic conversations or very financial conversations, I actually mentally disengage a little bit because that's not where my mind, it, it's no longer my mind that is my main tool, actually. It's much more, the, the, yeah, it sounds very obvious, but it's feeling, it's the heart or the gut or the body, but it's, I, I feel that that is what I need now. And therefore I create those situations for me. and in creating it for myself, I realized that other people need that too. We need softness and togetherness. Exactly. And yeah. Exactly. And you, you will create yourself as a role model for others. And that's really, really good. Yeah. And unfortunately, many people need a, a very uh, 
interesting moment in life uh, to come to this, you know, but hopefully we can in a certain moment, not everybody needs that their partner dies or some disruption here like Corona thing, you know, that to change our minds in the sense that we include the whole, whole life and yeah. not only decisions from here as we learn with Otto Sharma, no? that the yeah. decisions need to be and actually, we always decide emotionally. Also, when we find rationalizations and think we have decided for because of that, normally we haven't. You know. I think it's it's more of an acceptance and a, of the realization who we really are, instead of sort of knowing it. But you know, because we we have this sense of control when we're younger. I think many of us feel like hey we can get to a school we can get a job we can earn a good living we can buy a beautiful house and it feels like hey you can build up your life and and it's it's a um it's 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 partially illusionary you mm -hmm. know we do not control things happen and indeed the way we respond and act in the world is is often also not considered and rational you know it's it's emotional it's coming from the subconscious so what actually is happening is probably something very different from what we think is happening or from what we think our role is in that happening. Yeah, exactly. And I think I've come out of my denial of that. I've just started to accept that. So embody that a little bit more that, yeah, what life is happening, it's happening. And we don't control it that much as we can and, and no. as we think. And also in talking in integral terms, taking uh, giving more importance to the inter internal, you know, yeah, and and accept that that this first of all exists, and second of all that's very important. We don't have to deny the other part, the the the, the brain part and the yeah. thinking part, but we have to get that together, and that's the hope for the future. Yeah, very much. Uh, thank you, Patrick. That's. I hope we can inspire people to become whole people also without needing to have any death in their family. And if it happens, be courageous and be curious also what you can do out of it. What can what good can come out mm. of it? Always something good comes out of horrible circumstances. And we have to think about that now when we hear all these horrible things which are happening in the world. Yes, they are mainly because of, let's say, man-made faults. <laughs> yeah. it's always, almost always the case, but we don't need to despair and we can make ourselves pure resilient and learn from that and connect. Yeah, I, I, if, if I may add a, perhaps a closing thought is indeed yeah. um, throughout the process, there has been uh, happiness and sadness. So as such, it's no different from a life in which death is not as present. You know, so it's, I don't no longer see death as a horrible thing that happened to me. It's a intense process that had big, beautiful moments. You know, I think I've had more than my average age, fair share of beautiful moments as a result of the process that we lived through. So I, if I would be able to give anything as a, let's say an insight or a present would be to reframe death from being a horrible thing to being a natural thing that has beautiful qualities, including sadness and yes. grief. Yes, thank you. That's a very, very good closing word. I thank you very, very much. And thank you that you came on and talked with me about that. Yeah, you're welcome.